Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. On Sunday, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change presented its synthesis report. It has been called the most important document on climate change in history, as it provides the most important and comprehensive scientific evidence of the link between human activity and climate change and its dire impacts. The report also provides solutions to mitigate and adapt to climate change. Joining us today in our studio to help us understand the, the details of the report is Dr. Giovanni Baiocchi. Dr. Giovanni Baiocchi is an applied environmental economist at the Department of Geographical Sciences at University of Maryland College Park. Giovanni's main research looks at the global and local impact of economic activity, including trade, urbanization, and lifestyles. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So let's begin by doing a, a summary of the main findings of the synthesis report. Well, the synthesis report uh, just puts together, um, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the summary of summaries, if you like. It puts together, uh, presents to the policymaker all, this, uh, all the recent evidence of climate change happening. And um, uh, it basically tells us that uh, the climate change is happening. We are, you know, we are very confident that this is happening. It tells us that uh, humans are responsible mostly for these changes and provide some options, policy options to mitigate um, the, this, 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 these changes. So basically it's, um, it's reviewing all the recent literature on the subject, uh, hundreds of scientists, thousands of pieces of literature and put together, that's, that's, the best way to put it is all the pieces put together are a powerful, uh, you know, something emerges, something different emerges that, that, that shows that uh, this, this, there's overwhelming evidence of, of, of change happening. And, um, and this, though each individual part uh, can be taken, uh, can be discussed on, and uh, you, know, you could have a temperature here and there, but when you put everything together, the sea level rises, the human activity, the, the emission that goes with it, you, you, you have a powerful uh, image of, uh, of what's actually happening. And your particular role in working group three uh, included what? Uh, I I was um, I well I'm still kind of am um, uh, uh, lead author in uh, for the summary uh, the technical summary so the kind of background material that goes into the uh, summary for policymaker and I was a contributing author also in several chapters uh, on especially on trends of emissions and um, energy. And um, you know, you, there is no real contribution as such, but there is because we are supposed to review the material that's out there. But we still need to provide a, you know, our expertise to select the relevant material, to summarize, synthesize, and put pieces together so that a, a, a whole picture emerges out of it. Right, so the IPCC has after all these years, finally come out with some very bold um, and, and uh, analysis of the dire impacts and has made some very serious recommendations for us to deal with it. What are they? Oh, there are uh, many. First of all, yeah, as you correctly say, the statements are getting bolder. So it's, we've been saying this for a long time, scientists have been saying this for a long time, but now the evidence is really overwhelming, the data is, plentiful and when you put everything together you know the the, the, the picture is, is, is very clear and what what the, the, the report puts in is also you know it makes some recommendation of course it cannot be um, prescriptive in a sense you you cannot tell the policy makers what to do so you always have to make a, you know offer some options and you know there are many options depending on sectors and, and human activities from from the simple thing we can do every day like taking a bike to go to work uh, putting some insulation in our homes uh, to the you know the bigger things that will require a lot of technological investment and, and uh, research and development like carbon and capture storage and uh, and and uh, you know solar and wind power uh, you know um, technology. So it's, 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 there is a bit for everybody, from the building sectors to the energy sector, 
uh, to the cities, how they're structured, how important it is to have um, a particular types of uh, city structures. And, so, and everything is organized in chapters, and um, every chapter proposes some sort of um, options that policymaker can pick uh, to, uh, uh, to help mitigate climate change. Right. In the draft report of the IPCC synthesis report, one of the things that it showed is that the United States and China, the largest emitters of greenhouse gases, CO2 emissions, in the world was the United States and China. Yes. Further, it added that the top 10 countries, and it listed who those countries were, that contributed to 70% of the emissions were also identified in the report. I understand that that part of the report is now not included in the synthesis report. And why is that so? Explain to us what some of the processes are at the UN that would allow the IPCC to do something like this. Well, as I said, it's, it's, uh, it's also a political process. It's scientists meeting politicians. And, um, and, uh, and though we try to the report tries to preserve at least integrity and, and be consistent with what the underlying reports uh, says. There, there is usu usually a big debate on how to, uh, to present um, the findings. There is a constraint. When we do research, we are allowed to name names. We are allowed to say these countries are the top emitters. We are allowed to say this kind of... When we review this material and, and put it into the, these summaries, we, we are not allowed to do that. So we have to come up, we try to come up with a classification that, that makes, we cannot name individual countries, but so we try to come up with some sort of classification uh, that allows at least to link, uh, you know, everything needs to be linked to somebody or, or something to be able to uh, actually do some meaningful uh, intervention. But every, time of class, every type of classification uh, was kind of rejected because there are intense um, uh, negotiation going on and, uh, and the status of a developing country versus a non developing it's, it's, it's negotiated these days. So the fact that you have high income, it's irrelevant. And um, though we try to, to, you know, to, 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 find, to present at least some groupings that will help us uh, identify those countries and see, you know, what the share of responsibilities or uh, um, uh, what they can do about this. Uh, this this could not come into this could not be put into the into the report. Uh, so if so, basically, the science is getting stronger in a sense, but actually being able to do something about it, it's becoming actually harder because a lot of these links, even sectoral links. It's very difficult to to mention energy sector, and and and, and you know, people will you know, politicians will complain, and so that it has been a bit removed and, and and put into into the background. So every link to something you know that can help us uh, put things in practice, it's 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 a bit weaker in in the report, in the final report, not in the underlying um, reports, just in what goes on main display as the summary of policymakers. Uh, it just, it's a compromise between what is politically acceptable to say and, and, and what scientists uh, would like to say. That seems absurd to me in terms of, you know, you're, you're mandated with a job as scientists and you're supposed to draw some conclusions based on scientific evidence and then you're left to not be able to say what is really happening. So when, when you have countries who are more responsible and historically responsible for the situation we find ourselves in, it seems to me only fair that in terms of looking at solutions and uh, addressing, addressing the, the problem, uh, we have to look to those uh, countries that have done the most damage to the environment. Doesn't that make sense to you? It absolutely makes sense. It is a complex problem because historical responsibility is one thing and current development is another thing. So uh, countries that are historically responsible for cumulative emissions happening from uh, the Industrial Revolution are the traditional Western countries, whereas the new emerging econ on economies are the ones that are growing faster at the moment and they are responsible almost emissions right now. We try to present all 
options all cases so that so so that one could you know s you could see that who is responsible historically and who is currently to, to try to make sure that there is a compromise between these countries um, that we can reach some sort of an agreement and um, but as you can imagine this is very complex and um, and and countries found it very hard to to first of all, they find it very hard to accept and because again this position of being develop, a developing country it's is negotiated making making any claim in this in a UN type of document that says you are high income so you should be held responsible or you contributed to this so you should be responsible was deemed became highly controversial and therefore um, cuts had to be made and compromises had to be reached. So this kind of information is less visible. Unfortunately, I would think it makes um, progress more difficult, but there are some you know, uh, negotiation going on and this are affecting this process. And do you think that uh, there's been enough um, urgency created in terms of getting the world leaders and those responsible for the negotiations to a more binding agreement than we've had before. You know, we had Kyoto, which was not binding. Um, now, 25 years later, we are looking at another potential agreement. But how good is that agreement if there's no, you know, hard uh, uh, binding measurable uh, ties to it? Well, I, I would say that the, the science is pretty strong now, especially if you put everything together. If you put everything together, there is no doubt. The change is happening. It, it's, 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 it increases the risk of uh, further uh, damage uh, and, uh, and uh, irreversible damage to the environment, to our socioeconomic systems. There, there are complex issues. For example, you mentioned China and, and the United States. Now, one important component I'm studying is, for example, the you know, trade relationships between countries. And you know, sometimes some countries appear to be reducing emissions, but actually they're importing more and more from other countries, mm -hmm. like China. So in a certain sense, if we don't take into account, this is also a matter of, this is another aspect we try to bring in, the consumption-based emissions. So there is a, Emissions you are responsible for because of what you consume, and emission you're responsible for because of what you, what you produce. What you had in mind was China's production emissions, so territorial emissions. But what's even more important is our d responsibility by demanding goods from China, maybe stopping production in our, in our own countries that become more you know, focused on services and less polluting activity. So here we are saying we are decreasing emissions while at the same time we are deindustrializing and importing more goods uh, from uh, countries that are not bound by any agreement so even the kyoto protocol was you know had two tier it's a two tier system some some countries are bound to to, to do something and other countries were not so in a certain sense we need to look at all these aspects and 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 in that sense these developing countries um, have, a, have a more limited responsibility. We are also responsible in, in, in what they do. And that's, that's why we need to come together and, uh, and together make sure that the best technology is adopted, that we reduce our demand. There has to be uh, something like that happening as well. And together we you know, improve the situation and reduce emissions so that we cannot reach this dangerous uh, two degrees. Dr. Bayoki, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.